If you have to talk about how big it is, is it really that big? I finally did it. I finally read the entire trilogy of A Court of Thorns and Roses by Sarah J. Mass. Was it worth it? Probably not. But you know what this means? It means we fucking hydrate because bitches are thirsty. Today I'm gonna to be talking about A Court of Wings and Ruin, which is the third and final book of the Court of Thorns and Roses series by Sarah J. Mass. If you are new here, I've been reviewing every book leading up to this momentous occasion. I have a review for the first and second book that I have in the description, but I will go ahead and give you a recap so you don't have to watch through that shit. It started off as a Beauty and the Beast retelling, but instead of a furry beast, he's a fairy. I bring this up in every review video I've made of this series. In the words of Katie's book nook, fairies are basically humans, but with magic and big dicks. That's it. That's the extent of the world building. That is all you need to know. Like Beauty and the Beast, there is a curse. She breaks it with true love. They live happily ever after. The end. And then we have the second book. Wait, this is not it. I can't remember shit anymore. And then we have the second book. This time, Sarah's like, hey, remember Tamlin? The guy that we built up as the sweet love interest that we all need to root for? Guess what? Fuck that guy, we're going for recent. He was the bad guy in book one, but that shit doesn't matter because in book two, he's got the bigger dick. You gotta want more in life. When you go to Subways, you don't buy the six inch, you buy the foot long. Am I right, ladies? Treat yourself. I know what you're thinking. You're like, wait a minute, if Tamla's character was built up in book one, why are we throwing that all away in book two? What's the purpose of that? Doesn't that make the entire first book a complete waste of time? You know what? Stop asking all these questions. We are hopping on recess dick now, and at this point, we don't even remember what Tamla Tampon's name is anymore. Book two is when the story deviates from the Beauty and the Beast structure because at this point, the main character, Feyre, is about to marry Tamlin, but she is really sad because Tamlin is now abusive. She ends up running away with the villain from the first book, Resan, that was his name. <laughs> when she runs away with him, she finds out that he has the secret city that is basically a utopia where other fairies can coexist and live peacefully, and he's actually a pretty chill dude. He's been a good guy all along. He is a huge contrast to Tamlin's character because now that Tamlin is abusive, Resan is like this completely different dude who always emphasizes that it is Feyre's choice. Whenever she wants to do something, he doesn't hold her back the same way that Tamlin does, he tells her, you know what? It's your choice, because I invented feminism. Several sex scenes later, the book eventually ends with Tamlin showing back up again, and he reveals that he let some random king from nowhere invade the Fairyland Kingdom just to get Feyre back. It was a dumb political move because she don't even want his ass back. Also, Feyre's two sisters, Elaine and Nesta, fall into a cauldron that turns you into a fairy, which is like super devastating because they did not want pointy ears. Feyre ends up having to offer herself up to Tamlin so that he would let go of Nesta and Elaine and they would be able to run away with Resand, and that is how the book ends. With her being separated from her family and from Resand, and being stuck with Tamlin. Which finally leads up to book three. What is gonna happen? Well, don't worry, because I read all 700 pages, and now I can tell you exactly what goes down. The book starts with Resand's perspective now, because there's only so much we can take from Feyre. It opens up with the scene of Resand going through a haze of dead bodies, trudging through the ruins of the war. It's kind of like a metaphor of what I'm going through, trying to piece together the hot mess that is this story. And I was like, you know what? This is kind of interesting, because book two was such a slog to get through since we were stuck in Feyre's head the whole time. At least now we can kind of change it up with different character perspectives, but this is the only time that you ever see Rizan's perspective. And then for the rest of the book, you're back with Feyre again. So then it's like, 
What was the point? After that throwaway prologue, you finally get to chapter one. The book starts off with Feyre painting. I still don't know what she's painting to this day. The painting was a lie, a bright, pretty lie. Yeah, because you never explain what you actually paint. You just use a bunch of abstract metaphors for color and then you hope the rest of us figure it out. But she is stuck with Tamlin and has to ask complacent because we got to make it really obvious that he's abusive. Tamlin nodded, monitoring my every movement as I neared them. The painting looks beautiful. It's nowhere near done, I said, dredging up that girl who had shunned praise and compliments, who had wanted to go unnoticed. Him silencing her is a metaphor for how he silences her. It's very nuanced. It really makes you think. Farrah continues to be humble and says, it's still a mess. To which Tamlin smiles back and says, I think we all are. That is the truest fucking statement you have ever said in this whole series. I agree, I think we all are a mess. I'll drink to that. What Tamlin doesn't know though, is that Feyre is a badass now. And you can tell this because she's constantly thinking about how much she's a badass every other page. While she's acting submissive on the outside, she has this whole entire plan on the inside. And her plan is to make him a cuck. Book one had plan A, and the A stands for Amarantha. Book two had plan B, which is what they need to take. Book three is plan C, which stands for cuck. We all know that the only way a woman can show how deceptively strong she is, is by seducing people. So she spends the first third of the book trying to make it seem like she's into Lucian so that there is a sense of tension and distrust between the male fairies. She's even getting involved politically because she's having an argument with this other guy, Dagden, who explains the cauldron will study the work they've already done and magnify it until the wall collapses entirely. It is a careful, complex process and one I doubt your mortal mind can grasp. To which she replies, probably, though this mortal mind did manage to solve Amarantha's riddle and destroy her. Um... I'm not sure if you want to brag about that because in book one, literally everybody knew the answer to the riddle except for you. You didn't figure it out till like two people died first. So I'm not sure if you want to flex that. Like if you're going to brag about how smart and cunning you are, this is not the kind of example that you should reference. One improvement is that one of the side characters, Lucian, finally grew a spine because at the end of book two, he realizes that his soulmate is this chick that he met five minutes ago. So now he finally has thoughts of his own instead of being Tamlin's bitch. But I do want to note this part. Page 345, Lucian offers to do something. I stepped forward and didn't give Lucian time to step back as I hugged him tightly. Thank you. It was time, Lucian said quietly, giving me a squeeze for me to do something. Bitch, it took you 300 pages of the last book of the trilogy to finally do something? Lucian is a late bloomer in the head. But at least he's finally formulating some own independent thoughts because now he's able to run away together with Feyre because he's like, actually, you know, Tamlin is not that cool of a dude after all. But as they're trying to run away, they get caught by Ianthi which I think is how you pronounce her name. But she's like this priestess that tries to make Lucian be a hoe for her. So she has Lucian shackled up. She's touching him in places he don't want to be touched. And then Feyre uses her mind to control Ianthi. She tells Ianthi to unshackle him. Ianthi does. And then she tells Ianthi to pick up that rock. And she does. Then she says, put your right hand on that boulder. And then she does. And then she says, smash your hand with the rock as hard as you can until I tell you to stop. And then she does. The hand she had put on him, on so many others, Ianthi brought the stone up. The first impact was a muffled, wet thud. The second was an actual crack. The third drew blood. Her arm rose and fell, her body shuddering with the agony. And I said to her very clearly, you will never touch another person against their will. You will never convince yourself that they truly want your advances, that they're playing games. You will never know another's touch unless they initiate, unless it's desired by both sides. Damn, Feyre is shaming that hoe for non-consensual sex. She may be annoying, but that scene, dare I say it, 
kind of savage. Feyre is like, if you're gonna be a hoe, you're gonna be a hoe with consent. Am I gonna ignore the fact that consent was never a thing in the first book with Rhysand? Well, that's different because he's a hot guy and you're a conniving bitch. Feminism. We get to the middle part of the book where Feyre and Lucian reunite with Tamlin and the other side characters who I totally forgot about until they got introduced again. The only character I remember is Cassian just because he had this weird sexual tension with Nesta that was never explained. The group is back together again. There are many hugs. There are many I miss you's. There's banter around the dinner table when they eat because they're a found family now. These groups of characters are the most boring ass found family I have ever read. But it's nice that Feyre is reunited with her sisters again. In particular, Elaine keeps saying that she sees shit and people just think that she's being delusional and it takes over 300 pages for them to realize, hey, maybe she sees shit because she literally just fell into a cauldron and has powers now. Everyone one approaches Elaine like she's a wounded animal. Lucian just pines for her the entire time while she's like, whose man is this? Nesta hasn't changed. She still has a stick up her ass. I only ship her with Cassian because I'm hoping that if she finally gets laid, she won't be such a bitch. At this point, I want to play a drinking game. Take a shot every time they say mate or say female as a noun or ask a question without a question mark at the end of the sentence or use an ellipsis for dramatic effect. You thought Rhysand was woke in book two? Just wait till you read this shit. Apparently, Rhysand has been saving all these priestesses who have been abused by men. He has taken them in to his shelter and now they all work at this magical library haven. And he always emphasizes that it's their choice what they want to do because they have spent their whole lives at the hands of cruel, abusive men. They deserve the right to choose how they want to live the rest of their lives from now on. Last book, he was a feminist. This book, he's Saint Teresa. When the suffragette movement happened, you know who was in the center of everything? Rhysand. You probably didn't even know that, did you? Of course you wouldn't, because Rhysand is humble and he never reveals that he's a good guy after all, but he was there. There's this sexy scene where there's foreplay and Rhysand suggests that Feyre and him go fucking in the library. But unfortunately, later on, there are intruders that come into the library and threaten the lives of those women. They end up having to kill them, but Rhysand is still really upset and shook by this because the library was supposed to be a safe place for these women to congregate. Bitch, you were the one who suggested having sex with Feyre in the safe house for victims of sexual assault. That place was going to get defiled anyway. It was either going to be tainted from the attack by the war or an attack from Feyre's taint. So don't act like you were trying to keep it clean, you nasty. That being said, I did enjoy, well, enjoy is a strong word. I did like better this portrayal of Rhysand and Feyre in this book compared to the other two books. There was this one part where they had a conversation after Feyre spoke out against Rhysand and she approached him later asking if they were okay because she felt awkward with how she spoke out against him in public and he's like, of course that's okay. Babe, I want you to challenge me and call me out when I'm misspeaking. And she's like, you know what? I want you to do the same for me too. Even though this shit has no nuance whatsoever, Whatsoever. I can appreciate that they are becoming a power couple and they're making it very clear, perhaps too clear, but still very clear that when you are in a relationship with someone, you should feel comfortable to challenge each other and call each other out because that is how you two can truly be equals who are still respectful and supportive of one another. Which leads me to my next point. Am I on crack or is this book actually better? Did I like this book? No. I'm just saying, compared to the first two, I thought that the relationship was depicted much better and I thought the pacing was better too. Which is weird because a lot of people complained about the pacing of this book and praised the second book in comparison. In my opinions, were the total opposite because the second book dragged on for fucking ever. At least this one had some stuff going on, like actual events happened in this book. When I talked about this in my Goodreads review, there was a comment where someone was like, oh, just admit that you like this better because of the sex scenes. Of course I liked it better because of the sex scene. Why else would we be reading this? For the plot? Bitch, what fucking plot? Where is it? Where's the fucking plot? You look me in the eye right now and you tell me what the fuck kind of plot there was. Sarah J Mass described more details in any of the sex scenes than she did for the entire world building of the war. You tell this to my face right now that you disagree. You can't because I'm right. Why else would we be reading this? For the character development? Bitch, where? The man you were supposed to root for in the first book isn't even in this book like half the time. His ass got kicked to the curb and even I forgot about him. Which brings me to my next point. 300 pages into this book, 
Tamlin finally shows up again, and at this point, I realize, wait a minute, Tamlin is still here? <laughs> I forgot he was the main character because he literally hasn't been mentioned in the last 200 pages. Imagine starting the series as a Tamlin fan, and you're like, man, this guy is just so nice. He's just so nice and sweet. Then you find out there's two more books in the series and you're so excited and then you read it. And then you're like, what, what? Tamlin just gets worse and worse with every fucking book. And you're like, whose man's is this? I like how every time Tamlin shows up, you can just tell that everybody hates him. The other characters, the author, the readers. Every time he shows up, you can feel the collective groan of everybody in the room. They're like, oh my god, this motherfucker again. It's kind of funny because now he's like that guy. Every time he walks in, people are just like, boo, you suck. Tamlin's like, dude, what the fuck? I was the hero in the first book and I have PTSD. PTSD more like PT pussy because you suck. No one wants you here. Man, who the fuck invited this clown? You ain't shit. You were never shit and you would never be shit. Listen, he's not the best, but there was this one scene that stood out to me. Tamlin walks into a room, everybody is pissed because nobody likes him. Risa and Tamlin are about to fucking knock each other out. There's like a lot of tension in the room because Tamlin knows that Feyre has ultimately chosen Risa in the end. Tamlin says, it would seem congratulations are in order. To which Risa replies, we can discuss the matter at hand later. And then Tamlin says, don't stop on my account. Risa says, I'm not in the business of discussing our plans with enemies. No, Tamlin said with equal ease, you're just in the business of fucking them. Bruh. I'll give him that, you know? Dare I say it? Kind of savage. Speaking of savage, I would now like to read out loud the sex scenes. In every scene where they smang, it is always referenced about their wings because, you know, everybody's a fairy now, so wings are an essential part of your body. The wings are very sensitive, and if they get stroked during sex, then the fairy comes. As I was saying, if you just stroke the wing, then they come. It's kind of like having a second clitoris. I have tabbed the scenes that I am referencing to so that I can read it out loud to you and for my neighbors who are listening. So Risen and Feyre are able to communicate with each other using their minds and they regularly send images to each other. It's like sexting but worse. I sent back an image of me sticking out my tongue at him. My clothes were back on when his answer arrived. Like mine, it was wordless, a mirror image. Like mine, Risa's tongue was out, but it was occupied with doing something else. What was he doing? Was he licking a lollipop? I really have no clue. Page 138. Reese only extended a hand, his own fingers shaking. Even the towel was abrasive against my too sensitive skin as I laid my hand on his, his calluses scraping as they closed over my fingers. I wanted them scraping all over me. But he simply led me into the bedroom, step after step, the muscles of his broad back shifting beneath his jacket, and lower, the sleek, powerful cut of thighs, his ass. I was going to devour him from head to toe. I was going to devour him from head to toe. Even his toe? Bone apple titty. Why is Farah talking about the cut of his thighs like she just saw a bunch of chicken thighs at the supermarket? She goes to the frozen section and she's like, my, 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 look at them thigh, thigh, thighs. Boner appetite. Now I want to read my favorite scene. I stroked my hand over him once, twice, luxuriating in the feel of him in knowing he was here. We were both here, safe. Then I echoed the movement with my mouth. His growls of pleasure filled the tent, drowning out the distant cries of the injured and dying. Life and death hovering so close, whispering in our ears. But I tasted Reese, worshipped him with my hands and mouth and then my body, and hoped that this shard of life we offered up, this undimming light between us, would drive death a bit further away, at least for another day. She gave him a blowjob in the middle of a war. There are literally people dying outside their tent, and she just gave him a BJ. Only a few more Illyrians died during the night, but high up in the hills, the screams and wails of Tarquin's people rose to us on plumes of smoke from the still burning fires Hybern had set. Bitch, how the fuck are you gonna suck a dick while people are literally dying outside? Can you imagine giving like a BJ while people are screaming and begging for their lives outside? Fair is like, listen, I know there's a war going on and people are dying outside our tent and we can all hear their screams of anguish, 
but I really gotta suck that dick. It's dinner time, mama's hungry. Especially when I see that cut of that thigh. This isn't a sex scene, but it's still kind of relevant. On page 397, there is a dialogue between Reese and Cassian. Reese says, you're about to have one hell of a day. No going back now, Cassian said to Reese, gesturing to his wings. Reese slid his hands into his pockets. I figure it's time for the world to know who really has the largest wingspan. If you have to talk about how big it is, is it really that big? Do you think Rhysand and Cassian just go in a room together and just whip out their dicks and just measure it just to see? Just to see who holds the record? Just to see for science? Boner apple titty. And now we get to the ending of the book. Towards the ending, one of the side characters reveals that she is a lesbian. Page 588 is where the monologue begins and it continues for the next six pages. I will read to you the entire monologue and then speed it up just so that you can feel how long this monologue was. I don't love Azriel. No, that's not true either. I, I do love him as my family. And sometimes I wonder if it can be more, but I do not love him. Not the way he, he feels for me. The last words were a trembling whisper. Have you ever loved him that way? No. She wrapped her arms around herself. No, I don't. You see, I can't love him like that because I prefer females. <laughs> I slept with Cassian because I knew it would mean little to him too, because I knew doing it would buy me a shot at freedom. If I had told my parents I preferred females, you've met my father. He and Baron would have tied me to that marriage bed for heiress, literally. <laughs> I sleep with males in part because I enjoy it, but also to keep people from looking too closely. But I hid it. I hid in it because she tilted back her head, looking skyward. Because I live in terror of my family finding out and shaming me, hurting me about this one thing that's remained wholly mine, this one part of me. I won't let them, won't let them destroy it or try to. So I really, during the war, I finally took my first female lover. Her name was Andromesh, and she was so beautiful and kind, and I loved her so much. For three years, I tried over and over, and by the time I managed to find a hole to cross, she had married a man and had an infant daughter with another on the way. I didn't set foot inside her castle, didn't even try to see her. I just turned around and went home. And as for the males, it never went as deep. The bond, I mean, even if I did still crave, you know, every now and then. If I can even work up with the courage to tell the world first, my gift is truth, and yet I have been living a lie my entire existence. I wanted to tell you, I realized I wanted to tell you the moment you and Azriel would know to Hybrid's camp, and the thought of not being able to tell you, her fingers tightened around mine. I promised the mother that if you made it back safely, I would tell you. It's gone for so long, so long. I'm petrified to face him, to tell him he spent 500 years pining for someone and something that won't ever exist. The potential fallout. I like things the way that they are. Even if I can't, can't really be me, I, things are good enough. This entire scene and monologue was six pages. And you didn't see this because I read it out loud, but I counted and there were 70 ellipses. Seven, zero, 70. There were so many times where she paused in the middle of her monologue and then repeated her statement all over again. And that is how we end up with a six page monologue about a character who becomes a lesbian for no fucking reason. I'm not homophobic, 
But I don't think the gays deserve rights. Not after reading this scene. You would think that with this surprising coming out out of nowhere, they wouldn't even have time to fight in the war. But they do. It's not shown that they're fighting in the war. It's just said that they are. And then Resand is gonna die. And Feyre freaks out and she's screaming and her world is just crumbling down. And she's like, oh my God, please don't let him die. She's like screaming her head off. She's freaking the fuck out. I'm like, dude, calm down, bitch. Just because the book says that he's dead, doesn't mean he's actually dead. He's not gonna die. The dick is too good for him to die. Also, you literally have no identity outside of him. If he's gone, so are you. And lo and behold, he gets revived again. The war is over, peace has been restored, and now it is time to make amends. Before a series concludes, there must be closure between Feyre and Tamlin. I had not spoken to him, had barely seen him after he had told me to be happy and given me back my mate. He had left the meeting before I could say anything. So I gave Lucian a note to hand to him if he saw him, which I knew. I knew he would. My note to Tamlin was short. It conveyed everything I needed to say. Thank you. I hope you find happiness too. That's it? And I did. Not just for what he had done for Reese, but even for an immortal, there was not enough time in life to waste it on hatred, on feeling it and putting it into the world. So I wished him well. I truly did and hoped that one day, one day, perhaps he would face those insidious fears, that destructive rage rotting away inside him. So the two are just magically chill with each other now. Every scene between them in this book was just them tossing insults at each other. And now that we get to the end, Farrah's like, you know what? Life is too short to be resentful of people. We gotta live, love, laugh. Tamlin may have abused me and I may have insulted him and made him a cuck, but I have found peace now and I hope Tamlin does too. There wasn't even like a bridge between how hateful they were to each other to how peaceful and chill they are now. I guess it is an important lesson to remember. Life is too short for hatred and we have to invest our time and energy wisely. Like sucking a dick in a tent while people are dying. That's the real moral of the story. And with that, we are finally done with the trilogy. I wanna say thank you to Sierra from the book Dragon Reese for gifting me the box set of these books. If she hadn't sent me these books, then these videos never would have existed because I never would have read it. Wait, should I be thanking her? <laughs> no, but seriously, this series was something that I never would have picked up on my own accord, but even though I didn't enjoy the books while reading it, I have realized that I found myself enjoying the process of reviewing these books and making these videos and seeing seeing everyone's reactions and comments to it. So it's weird because even though I didn't enjoy the stories, it's more like I enjoyed the journey of it. I think if it weren't for booktube, I wouldn't have Sorry, I was trying to not to burp. I think if it weren't for booktube, I wouldn't have enjoyed the series as I have all of the commentary and all of the stupid jokes and all of the demonetized videos that we've had. They've been a good time. Basically, thanks to Sierra and thanks to you, the viewers who are watching this and the people who are commenting on this, you have made the series much more enjoyable for me. So I genuinely mean it when I say that I don't regret this experience at all. Or maybe I have Stockholm Syndrome, who knows. And before you ask, yes, I will be reading the novella. I'm gonna save that for Christmas because I think the book takes place during Christmas or it's like some kind of Christmas special. So I gotta wait it out until it's a more appropriate time, but I will read it and I will continue with my thoughts on that. I also wanna thank Skillshare for compensating me for my pain. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes covering creative and entrepreneurial skills. Premium membership gives you unlimited access so you can join the classes and communities that are right for you. Skillshare is also affordable, especially when compared to pricey in-person classes and workshops. An annual subscription is less than $10 a month. You know, as much as I've trashed on Sarah J Mass, it is incredible the extent of effort and work that she has put into her books. I'm not saying story-wise or narration-wise or character development-wise, but more so just getting it done. It takes a lot of discipline to be able to finish a hefty project like that. And if you are interested in also trying to finish your own novel, a class I want to highlight is called the Writer's Toolkit. The teacher is a novelist that will go through a process that makes writing more approachable and fun. So if you take the class, you'll get to learn how to optimize your space for your writing style, you'll get to create a daily writing routine, and you get to gather and act on inspiration. These kinds of tools are really important to build upon so that you can create this long-term writing process 
and be able to publish your own 700 page book. That shit takes discipline. That shit takes practice. If you want to get better at that, take the Skillshare class and you don't have to pay any money because if you use my code, which is in the description, you can get two months of free Skillshare premium classes. The very last thing I want to do is give shout outs. Every time I hit a milestone, I will shout out a smaller booktuber so that they can get the clout too. Last time I did this, I had 54K. Now I have 56K. The first booktuber I want to shout out is Claudio Career Books. Claudio deserves a shout out just for his Witchathon wrap up alone. In that video, he dressed up as me for Halloween, specifically the video where I cried reading Crooked Kingdom. He put these post-it notes in his hair so that he would mimic my green hair that I had at the time. And he stitched a heart to mimic the sweatshirt that I was wearing at the time. So really, he went all out with this shit and he deserves a shout out. Even besides that video, he has a lot of other great ones. In particular, there is one where he is painting his bookshelf, which I thought was really cool. Check him out. He's really sweet and obviously super creative. The second book booktuber I want to shout out is Reading with Nori. Nori is great. I realize she deserves a shout out because she tweeted something that was very true. If you're into graphic novels, she has a lot of videos about that. In particular, there is a video that she has for the graphic novel readathon. And she also has some other videos about manga recommendations and her own manga collection. And what I thought was really cute was the way that she does her TBR videos, which involves a cookie jar. So again, I just like the way that people creatively try to approach those types of booktube videos. Definitely check her out. All these people, are great small booktubers that you should subscribe to instead and unsubscribe from me. Thanks for watching, goodbye. I